Hi everybody, I'm here with my good friend, Rich Napolitano, who's a tech industry executive, who's now, Rich, you're entering into a new journey. I'm really excited to be talking about this. I've been watching your career for years. Thanks for coming into the Marlboro studio. Good to see you. No, great. Dave, uh, good morning and good morning to theCUBE. And uh, it's great to be back on theCUBE. So a little different, well, right? A little I mean, different. You and I, first time on theCUBE was 2010. Yes. We were talking, you know, storage, cloud meets big data, all that stuff. And, you know, you've had quite a, quite a journey in, in your career. We'll talk about that. I mean, you started, I think actually we're in an old digital building. Uh, I think yeah, this is yeah. like some great. MRO building. Yes, right? yeah, great flashback. I think my wife actually interviewed in this building uh, before she started in the industry. There okay. were some storage guys here. I think it wasn't Grant, wasn't here, Grant Severe, is everybody who knows him from Adept Tech, but, uh, uh, but, but a guy named Irv Lyles. I don't know if you Irv remember Lyle, Irv Lyles. Lyles. He was a storage guy. They, back when digital made spinning disks, I think they had some marketing people out of this building. But yeah, so we're back. We're going to sound like old guys now. Uh, well, I, you know, hey, after COVID, I came out. I'm like <laughs> the oldest guy in the room all of a sudden, you know, a little grayer. But um, so, so you have a real systems background. I mean, Sun, EMC, you know, you did Plexi, you sold Plexi to HP and a bunch of other stuff going on. But tell us about your background. Yeah, no, uh, uh, I'm an engineer, you know, originally a software engineer, and I started my career at digital, as you pointed out, in the operating system group. Uh, it was a VMS operating system. And so uh, when I really boil it all down, the long career, I've really done one thing, which is build software for enterprises and sell it to them. That's really it. And so that pattern is exactly what's going on here now at E360. It's really the same thing. Build great software and uh, deliver value to a uh, very large scale enterprises to allow them to operate their businesses more efficiently, et cetera. So it's really the same pattern again, whether it's a big company or a small company, it's really the same challenges. Is build it? great software. Really? I mean, because yeah. yeah, when it's I heard you do wealth game. management, I'm like, what? Wait, is, this, is it like a FinTech firm? Are you doing crypto? Like, <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But explain, like kind of what attracted you to come to Advisor 360 and then we get into what you yeah. guys do. Yeah, so uh, so what is FinTech? It's a pretty big, pretty big spectrum. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people follow it. Uh, there's many things, everything, as you said, from crypto to regulatory tech, to mortgages, to payments, uh, to banking, to capital markets, and then wealth. And that's what we are. We're, we're focused on the wealth business. So if you will, you know, uh, we aspire to be the sales force of wealth. So building software for wealth, uh, wealth industry. And what, what fascinated me uh, about the company was that um, uh, this industry is extremely fragmented, right? It's, it's almost like the early days of the solar system where there's all these companies and technology out there and these large enterprises are trying to go on the journey of transformation. We've we have seen. a chart on this. Alex, bring up that chart if you would. It's what's this called? Kitsis? K Kitsis. Kitsis. Michael Kitsis, Kitsis. wonderful I guy. I, I, I have, I, it, it, it reminds me of the security chart that I used from Optiv. Yes. You know, there's like 8,000 companies and it's a it's a mega eye test, but but explain this. Yeah, no, I mean, this is, this is, this is one of the things that attracted me to the industry. And, and frankly, I, I talked to Michael before uh, I joined A360. Because uh, it was, I wanted to understand more about the industry, and and I mapped it to exactly what you said. This chart looks just like the uh, software security chart, and so much like has happened in in software security, you see many of these point solutions that's out there in market, a huge amount of complexity, and uh, people use these tools to solve specific problems, and the market's highly fragmented with all these homebrewed weave together solutions that don't really solve the whole problem. So these are all point solutions, and these yeah. are all SaaS-based point solutions that have been around forever. Yes. Okay, so you guys are the new entrant, you're the disruptor. We're one of the new entrants. There's, new, there's probably 10 or 20 new com companies every day aimed at a specific little niche problem, whether it be trading or risk or document management or uh, back office workflow or, you know, there's a, a digital onboarding. There's a many, many point solutions. So when you look at this chart, when you see it in more detail, you'll see that uh, there are 10, 20 companies in each one of these point solutions with a tiny, tiny market share, tiny, tiny percent share of market, tiny, tiny revenue. They're often very small businesses, you know, maybe $10 million, $20 million, the vast majority, 90% or more of the people on this charter are less than $20 million. So we, we highlighted this all in one and you're yep. in there, Advisor 360's in there. So so is that kind of, what, what does that mean all in one? You guys do everything here? Or? Yeah, so so our, our joke is we're an all in one, but we're not an everything in one. So, <sighs> so we do a lot. 
So we do a lot. We, we basically allow the broker dealer to operate their business, right? And so, uh, you know, we, we do uh, reporting. We, so we do, you know, home office activities, which we'll talk about in a minute. We'll do a lot of advisor experience, which is why the company's called Advisor 360, and a client portal. But it's really based on something very, very important, which we'll talk more about, which is really there's a unique and very complicated data problem in this industry. The, uh, how, how, where'd the company come from? Maybe yeah, no, great, great question. So, so we, were spun, uh, we were spun out of one of the biggest and most successful independent broker dealers in the industry. Uh, it was called Commonwealth. And so Commonwealth advisors historically have been some of the most productive and most successful in the industry. So this technology has, has been what has, is powering Commonwealth for a long time. And one of the biggest insurance companies, the first or second biggest one, came to Commonwealth and said, we'd like this technology. And that's what formed our company. So we spun out of Commonwealth. We formed an independent company. I'll talk about that in a second because there's a lot of misunderstanding about oh, wait, that so, industry. So they, they, it was like an Amazon deal. They built this for themselves mm -hmm. and then said, hey, this is actually something that we could sell to others in the mm -hmm. industry, mm -hmm. including their competitors? Yes, including their competitors, yeah. exactly. Okay. I mean, it's a very interesting model, right? Because what they realized was that the expense, and we've seen this now in all of our pipeline and all our prospects, the expense to build this, depending on the scale of the company, is at least $50 million a year. A year? A year, to $100 million a year to build, deploy, and continue to innovate in this space because it's so rapidly evolving. That's a lot of staff, right? It's a, mean, lot a lot of staff. It's a lot of tech. A and... lot of developers. And so that's why you see so many point solutions out there because there's constant needs to continue to innovate in this area. So, you know, it's minimum, minimum to do a good job. It's $50 million a year of R&D. And so, so the idea was to take what was born inside of this one company called Commonwealth, spin it out, uh, bring other people onto the platform and create a shared R&D model of this independent software company. And so we learned a lot on that journey, but the, the key thing is that, you know, when you look at A360 now, what is it? It's, it's seven, 800 people now, it's a profitable entity, we're serving millions of households, we have a trillion dollars of assets under management, we have uh, a roadmap that is packed with innovation, and now we're taking this technology that's driving, you know, this is public now, Mass Mutual, one of the biggest insurance companies in the world, and Commonwealth, one of the most productive and successful independent broker dealers in the world's operations completely end to end. Now we're bringing that to market to even their competitors. So you, so you came in to actually turn this into a software business. Correct. Right? To take it out of just, Correct. you know, a one client business and, and, and bring it. So what, what was that journey like? And you obviously yeah, had to so, hire a bunch of people, you got yeah, a huge so, network. So, so it was an adventure. <laughs> uh, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I've learned so much in the last, in the last three years, because I'm not an expert in the wealth business. Obviously, for a long time, I've sold in financial services companies, as you know, you know, some of the biggest banks, uh, you name them, insurance companies, I've always sold uh, enterprise uh, things into for a very, very long time, you know that. And so uh, the journey was, you know, take, take this technology that was born as a department inside of a financial services company and bring it outside and have it stand on its own and then figure out how to modify that such that it could be an enterprise class service delivered to other enterprises at five times the scale and make that a software company in the middle of COVID. <laughs> so uh, thank God it worked, amazing team, uh, but huge amount of cultural transformation, huge amount of uh, you know, process and discipline, uh, you know, uh, different tools and technology brought together. So if you, if you look at people, processes, and underlying technology, all changed. We've already written more than 25% of the entire platform. This year, we'll write, we're at another 25% of the entire platform. So a huge amount of investment in R&D. And the culture, you say, it is a mindset to go from, okay, we got one client, we're an internal IT department, to we got to think like a software company? Is you that got right? it. So, uh, so the uh, pivot, how did you affect that? Yeah, so that was, that was hard in a lot of respects, um, honestly, because the nature of a financial services company is that they're, they're a services company. And so their approach to problems is oriented, service oriented which means it's people-oriented. And technology companies solve problems with technology first. So your instincts are actually 180 in the opposite direction. And so the, the evolution of tools and technology was really important. Like we, we adopted a whole new modern tool chain, which was frankly hard for some people. 
right? When I first joined, we weren't sure we can get this thing to scale to a factor of four or five greater, to deliver it as an enterprise class service, to build out a service delivery, metering and monitoring of everything in the infrastructure, to deliver you know, four to five nines of availability as an enterprise service. That all had to be built out from scratch, right? Um, engineering discipline around, uh, around uh, around testing and automation and and you know simple things like aha confluence and Jira. I mean, and how is that manifested? When we when I first joined, people said, ah, oh, you could never get this code to run in the cloud. So it's running the cloud, obviously, right? So now that the, our next client is deployed fully in Azure. Oh, interesting. I mean, when, when I first started, you know, when the cloud was just coming coming out in 2010. It wasn't. Financial companies would say, no way, I'm exactly. never going to go to the cloud. And now exactly. they're like the biggest consumers of the cloud. But, but I want to come back to the, the structure of the company. You're saying you're independent? What, what is the, yeah. the organization? So that's super important and frankly, one of the biggest misnomers about us. Um, so, so what does it mean to be spun out? Uh, we're, we're a privately held, privately funded company, right? And so we're held effectively, the structure is really very identical to what private equity does. So think about it as private equity owned, has to, happens to be a family office. And uh, so to be clear, we are not owned by CFN. Like that's just, they're a sister company. And the, uh, actually what they are to us is just a client. So the relationship is we just support them like we do any, uh, any other broker dealer, right? So it's really important to get that distinction down. Uh, so the private equity firms, something called Claridge, which people, don't get yet, which we're talking about more, so I appreciate the time to be able to say yeah. this. So, uh, so what's in Claridge? So Claridge is, is this family office, private equity. Inside of Claridge is a venture fund that has already funded 40 other companies, literally, and whether FinTech or consumer or dozens of other things. So that's one entity, which is called uh, Claridge Ventures, Claridge VC. Then there's Southworks Resorts, which has resorts in, 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 uh, in the Nassau, in Scotland, in, in the Cape Cod, I mean, all over the world, they have these resorts. Then there's Commonwealth, which was the, the company that we were spun out of, which is another portfolio company. Then there's something, a very, very important charitable entity called uh, the Elevate Prize, which is an enormous charity, which has done amazing things. And then there's us. So we're one of like six or seven things that are in this entity. But to be clear, like there's no one from CFN, our, our sister company, that, uh, that is on our board or has, has, sees access to any of our information. And we actually have an independent board of another two local entrepreneurs from Boston here. Bob Davis, who was the CEO of Lycos and Highland Capital. Right. Uh, he's the chair. And Bill Green, who was the CEO of Accenture. He was on ECMC's board, he's board yeah. uh, Pivotal's board, yeah. and still on Dell Technologies, SMPs board and a well-known you know, entrepreneur executive, and frankly, a great mentor of mine for a really long time, and many of the EMC guys knew, knew him well. But, but also more specifically, we are required by law to keep broker-dealers' information separate. Right. The SEC requires us to do that. So there has to be separation. So this is one of the big misnomers in the industry. The, the, the flip side of all this is, given our heritage and what we've already done, any future client gets the benefit of us having one of the biggest insurance companies in the world running their operations day to day with billions and billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars of assets, and hundreds of billions of dollars of assets in, in the biggest independent and most successful independent broker dealer in the industry. That's the benefit, which is already has critical mass in the industry and one of the biggest companies on that entire chart which no one understands. Actually, Alex, if you bring that chart back up, I want to ask you a question about that. And, and I mean, as I look at this, there's data inside of each of these. These are all SaaS applications. They're point Correct. tools. There's data locked inside of each of these. You got it. And so that's got to be a huge problem. We, I, all we talk about in this industry is data, data silos, how data <laughs> silos are constricting innovation, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Do you solve that problem? Yeah, I mean. And, and how do you solve it? Yeah, problem? no, and, and this was one of our biggest learnings. Uh, and when I joined, and and, uh, and it is it is somewhat the foundation of the company, and we we've named it. We call it UDF, Unified Data Fabric, because this is a very you've got to have an acronym. Yeah, of course <laughs> you have to have one. And you know I love the word unified <laughs> from my past lives, yeah, right? So uh, so the Unified Data Fabric is super important. It's really the foundation of our company, and one of the biggest challenges of this entire industry, and and one of the things that makes us most unique because those point solutions on that chart. None of them actually solve the data problem. There's not one. 
Because they got data fine. locked inside. Because they got it locked inside. They have their own little silo and they take a little piece of it. And they don't, And if you start by solving the underlying data problem, so what's the underlying data problem? The underlying data problem is if, if, you're, if you're a client, an end client of, this, of these advisors, then you, know, you have a house, you may have some cars, you may have a summer house, you, you might have a stock bond, mutual fund, insurance, annuities. You got all different types of asset classes. And all that data is disparate and mostly wrong. Because at any given moment, what is the share price of Salesforce at this instant across the world, traded in ADR through other exchanges, and if there's a stock split, how does it get propagated around the world? So we, the, the, your average advisor sitting in their office, they, they, they can't actually add up what your net worth is at any given moment. It's impossible. Once a year, actually. Yeah, and it's wrong. <laughs> the, day, the, the moment they give it to you, it's wrong. <laughs> and by the way, they probably, probably spent, our survey say, 17 hours, five hours, four hours, every time they create that for you. So we do that in a single click. So I think anybody can relate to this. I mean, if young people, you're not there yet, you're probably messing around with Robin Hood, making a few <laughs> investments, you got a 401k, but once that Correct. gets big enough, and That's you start right. having kids, you're like, okay, I got to get my act together, I got to maybe get a wealth advisor. So what happens is, you sit down with that individual, if, you know, once a year, if you're lucky, maybe twice a year, you talk on the phone every now and then, and basically what they'll do is to say, okay, when you, the, but it's a, it's a model with a bunch of assumptions. When are you going to retire? What's the stock market going to do for the next X number of years? What's our allocation mix? And then when, before you sit down at that meeting, you'll get an email or a phone call say, all right, tell us what's in your 401k that we don't manage. Tell us what's in your crypto account that we don't manage. What's in your B of A account, what, you know, whatever it is. What's in your private investments? And then you, you send them an email with a number, mm -hmm. which is static. Mm -hmm. And then they sit down and say, okay, here's the dashboard. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't, doesn't change. It's not right. dynamic at all. And Correct. then if you ask them, well, what about the insurance policy that we bought for you? Oh, I'll get back to you on that. So Correct. that data That's is right. not there at your fingertips. And so, so, so you guys provide it's, that service so mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. it's full visibility. So it's not so much, it, yeah, it's the broker dealer back end, but it's really the mm -hmm. advisor that you're servicing. Is yeah, that so that's why the name of the company, although we sell to the broker dealer, let's be clear, who pays our bill is the broker dealer, right. but the name of the company is Advisor360. And it's not an accident because we serve the advisor. And this is one of the, my greatest learnings in this industry, is in, in this industry, unlike most others, where like historically when we sold IT or software or VMware or whatever to these enterprises, you serve the enterprise, that was the user and the customer, mm. it's the advisor that has the power. Because the advisor in this industry has the relationship with the end client. And that relationship is usually important. So for most of this industry, the, if the advisor moves, moves firms, the clients, clients will go, go with them. 99% That's right. go with that advice, so, with him or her. So this technology is very important for, to get them hooked on, to make them productive, make them understand how they can be more productive, how when you have that meeting, it's productive. How whenever time they call, you call them, they, at their fingertips, they have all the information. And the, only if you solve this data problem first can you offer that value proposition. So how do you solve that data problem? I mean, you have all these, today that, that chart has all these independent data elements. There's no coherence between those data elements. What, what do you do? You just grab all those and stick them into a big so enterprise frankly, data warehouse. So tell us about how. You yeah, some of this it. is yeah, some of this is just the the genealogy of the company. So we've been solving and working, getting better and better to solve the problem for literally 20 years. Right, that's how messed up this is, and that's how long it's been messed up. We have hundreds of data feeds that come in every day. We have built out a huge amount of algorithms. Everybody else calls it machine learning. It's just algorithms, right? But uh, no, it's huge amount of ETL. <laughs> yeah, chat GPT. Well, we're going to use that too, but I don't want to give up. We're doing it. The Cube's yeah, using yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's just a powerful tool, and it's just another tool, right? But it doesn't solve world hunger, so let's not make it, you know, yeah, okay. there's not going to be full unemployment because we have chat GPT. Put it in the Hall of Fame, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, so we have hundreds of data feeds that come in every day, and just assume they're all wrong because they probably are mostly wrong. And so we have a set of algorithms that automate figuring out, oh, well, that feed was down, or that, that flat file came, half of it came, you know, uh, that, that exchange was down yesterday for some reason, and it goes through all this and weaves this information together in a way, and we're really good at this. That's one of the things I've learned. Like, we're really good. Because as we turned on our second client, we found all sorts of problems they had for like 100 years. So That they didn't even know about. Uh, it's hard to know, yeah. right? So, so we fixed all that, but we're really good at it. So that's our foundation. So on top of that foundation of data, we have this team that basically automates these processes, right? And then at the end, there are people that actually reconcile these differences. 
and we're getting better and better how, and automating those processes. So we just keep eating that up the stack and automating more and more of those processes. So we have a very large team that cleans and reconciles data on a daily basis. And then where's that data go? Does it it go goes this? into, well, in separate repositories for each of these broker dealers because we're right. required by law to do that. Um, and so that becomes the UDF. And on top of UDF, this is where our value proposition comes, on top of the UDF, we pour three uh, portals effectively. A home office portal for the broker dealer, that's their workflow. The advisor portal, which is for the advisor and the advisor's office, and a client portal. And because the data is ubiquitous and seamless for assets, classes, and insurance, investments, and, and banking, you can get a seamless experience across all of your capabilities. So if you trade, your reporting is correct. If your document, if you open an account and the account flows straight through to Fidelity, right? And a single signing, sign on ceremony straight through, your, your reporting is up to date automatically. If you, if you go into Yodel A and, and you add, add some checking account, it's brought automatically back into this, your view we call it a household view. So we take all these feeds, we cleanse and reconcile it, and we organize it, not how transactions occur in the industry, which is how most of the industry operates, but organized by you, your family, your household. And God forbid there's a divorce, we partition the household, and that happens a lot, unfortunately. So can I get access to it as the end client? Yes, you see it, you see that. When you log into your client portal, you see your household. And it's organized, all that's together. So it's not just, I mean, it sounds like you've done the ugly, nasty work at the back end with the data. It's not just sort of a pretty interface that you've laid on top of it, like Correct. we've seen so often in the storage industry. Correct. <laughs> right. It's not a, we're not a veneer, right? And there's a lot of people that don't solve. So we, we solve the hard problem first, which is actually part of the attraction. If you tie back why I'm here as, a, as an engineer and a technologist, what's your competitive mode? Well, ours is, this is a freaking hard problem. It's a really hard problem to get this data right. And we're really good at it. On top of that, then we can build our software and deliver those services to you in a seamless way. Driving advisor productivity, driving advisor CSAT, and therefore allowing for greater client experience, therefore more assets come under management, which is the fuel that funds this entire ecosystem. Happy end client, happy advisor, more assets, broker dealer makes more money, delivers better service, and that's the virtuous cycle. Do people ask you like, okay, tell me about the architecture, what's the data platform look like? Do they get into that? So we that? get, well, the broker dealers do. The advisors don't, right? So the broker yeah, dealer- they don't care, they just want it to work. But but so, so I, but I care, what, what's what's back there? Is it, so it sounds like you've got a multi-instance, it's not- or is So, it yeah, so or? it's, 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 it's semi-multi-instance, right? So we, uh, it's, it's mostly based on .NET because there's a lot of you know, SQL and stuff built on top of this. Mm -hmm. uh, more and more, all the new stuff, the last two years, of, two years plus have been in Python, right? And, and now, currently hosted on-prem, but DR'd to multiple sites, and then the next clients are all Azure-based, as I talked about. So, um, but most people, don't really care about that. What I get a lot of questions about is InfoSec is really important. We have a huge investment there because we have our clients' data. So we are, you know, we're 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 SOC two. We have all the HIPAA requirements, et cetera, et cetera, are all built into our platform. So we deliver an enterprise class service. So that's really, really. We get lots of questions about that, and we're proving at scale. This is one of our competitive advantages against like ninety nine percent of those people in that chart, and there are very few that are approved that are at scale. So. Lots of questions about architecture, security, scalability, uh, availability characteristics, metering, monitoring. These are all enterprise class services that we've built. And, and we were kind of joking about ChatGPT before, but yeah. but at the same time, it, the last hundred days have been pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. What's happening here? And you, you mentioned Python. It's the sort of language of the data science community. How do you see using AI? Is it just to affect automation? Uh, is it to do better? better prediction because the predictions today it's a bunch of Monte Carlo modeling which you know we all did in college it's like okay sure. it's nice but sure. it's you know but 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 so no, how that, do you see using AI in the future no I think this is really super important some of our partners like InvestNet do a lot in this space and so we're partnering with them on this they've made a lot of investments there um, and and so you know, a lot of what we do is, you know, we'll partner, we'll build, we'll, we'll acquire, we'll use every probe to create the right solution in the market. Um, you'll see more automation on our data flow, for sure, mm -hmm. right? So you see more robotic automation in terms of how we cleanse and reconcile data. It's a really important part of our strategy. Just get better and better at that, and there's, there's a lot of innovation there. Um, if you look at where the industry is now, 
it's there's a lot of discussion around you know what's the next best action for the advisor to take. Okay, now we have uh, two to three million households information today, a huge amount of data. That wow, now it's like okay, well, how do you bring this value? How do you bubble up this value? What what can you glean? What's the best practices for an advisor? Right, and then how do you combine that information with uh, with other public information about you know, job changes or life changes, you know, births, deaths, job economic change, data. economic data, and how do you bring that together to create insights for that advisor or their clients? And that's what we're moving to, right? Because a lot of the basic NESPEC action stuff is already being done by other people, but our, we have this wealth of information about these households and the nature of the household. So we're like the top of the pyramid of the understanding of all of those assets. So we see the application for things like GPT and other things. Now remember, we need to partition this data because we need to keep it separate. So it's constrained about what you can do legally. So but, we gotta be very careful. But about as that. we were talking about, I mean, you know this, for 50 years we've been automating <clears throat> processes in the technology industry. You're talking about automating insights. Correct. Um, which is different. That's sort of putting, putting the data first, putting the data at the center. Correct, <laughs> and, correct. And, and, and thinking about you know, uh, maybe it's embedding the business process inside the, the data or layering it on top? So it starts, this is, this is very important, and this was frankly a lot of my learnings the last um, three and a half years almost now, I think. Um, it has to start with the data. Like it, as, historically, we've always started with the workflow or the software. It's like, no, no, you start with the data here, right? You right. start with the data, solve that, and then you can pour the software on it but then you need to know the workflow. So it's really all of those. You get the data right, then you understand the workflow, and there are different personas. There's a home office persona, there's the advisor persona, there's the advisor's assistant, which is usually important in this whole model, because they do a lot of the work. And then there's the client, the end client. And, and each of those workflows and characteristics are really different. Like a simple thing that we've learned is like the white space requirement for the end client is super high, but the advisor is a B2B user and, and they, don't want, they don't want a lot of white space. Like, get that white space out of here. I don't, I don't want it to be pretty. I, it, I'm, not a, I'm not an iPhone. Like, what are, you, what are you doing? It looks beautiful. No, I don't want beautiful. I want dense, right? So the, you need to understand the persona, but it starts when you laugh, right? <laughs> right. The, the personas are very different. Yeah, right, absolutely. Right? And so, and so you can get confused. It's like, well, let's make it beautiful for the home office. Are you kidding me? They want dense work, simply tracked, like, come back, stop in the middle. Like, they, they're... They're business people. Yeah. Get that all the stuff out of my way. Right. And they get... Tiniest font that I can see. Like we're not a big screen. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> Alex, bring that chart back up. I want to ask Rich a question about the competition. So, so, I guess in a way these are the the competitors, but there's a lot of homegrown stuff going on too, right? Correct. So, Very so important. The homegrown stuff. What do they do? Do they fill their gaps with some of these point tools? So, who do you compete with? <laughs> so. Uh, so in, in some ways, everyone, and in, in other ways, uh, no one, right? Um, the biggest competitor is probably the status quo of mm -hmm. things that they built themselves because there's a lot of legacy systems that they built themselves historically. And so then the, the next pivot away from that is they'll go to the parts bin, right? These, the, early, the early formation of the universe here. Yeah, show that again, Alex, because I, I got a follow-up question. Like, I'm trying to figure out- So who, they'll reach into, you? like, you know, a, a, a sky is to help with digital onboarding or a Refinitiv to do some trading and they'll go to the parts bin and look for a piece. So they'll buy a tool or a widget for something and then they'll try to weave it together. And you're the consolidator of all And this, so right? we're basically the platform. Are you, are you, so you stick with our, our planet. Our uh, planet thing. Are you Jupiter? Is that what you're trying to so be? So we aspire to be Jupiter. So if you look at this, this is like the early days of the solar system okay. where there's lots of matter and the final configuration of the solar system has yet to be formed. And so the question is, are we Pluto or are we Jupiter? Yeah, you don't or want to the be Sun. Pluto. We don't want to be Pluto, Pluto bad. And data has gravity. So, so we're, <laughs> we, we could consolidate, you know, but the challenge in these accounts is they, uh, they really, um, a lot of the accounts we talk to, they go through their own analysis of build and buy, right? And more and more, they're realizing they can't really build. And it, this, this is reminiscent to me of the early days of Salesforce. So I don't know if you remember this, but back when I was at Sun, I took over the sales force. And I'm looking at my P&L, and I see 60 people working on building out a CRM on my sales team, 60. 
and I took over the Salesforce and we had to grow. And I'm like, well, kill that project, give that to Salesforce and hire 50 sales guys and give them a $3 million goal. I grew the revenue by probably $200 million, right? And I shifted my investment from building a CRM, which I get minimal benefit to, to getting feet on the street selling things. That's one of the key moves we did to get Sun growing again. Get out of the things that we're not good at and focus at where we're great at. These financial services companies are selling financial products. Go sell your financial products. Let, take, let me view that. It's interesting that it's happening, you know, whatever, 20 plus years after the, the tech industry. I mean, you see all with the email, with, with CRM, you know, with, with, with HR, with service management. You know, there's a different mindset in financial services though, right? I mean, it's more entrenched. They're IT shops, essentially. You know, they, they're, and they're actually pretty good IT shops. As you know, they're fairly sophisticated. Yep. Do you think, you think they're ready for this? Or, 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 are so, you selling to yes. senior yeah. managers who get this? Yeah, so that's, a, that's great. So we sell, uh, we sell to large scale broker dealers. So we're aimed, uh, and this industry is getting highly fragmented. Mm -hmm. Most of those people on that chart would sell to individual RIAs. So we, we don't sell that. We specifically do not sell to RIAs. We sell to aggregated, aggregations of advisors, right? So whether they be roll-up RIAs that have a thousand or two RIAs, we'll target them, or insurance broker dealers, you know, banking broker dealers, or independent broker dealers, which have a thousand or more of advisors. That's what we target, right? Those entities are going through this analysis of, well, what are we really good at? And what they're learning more and more, it's hard for them to, to acquire and retain talent because fintechs are sprouting up everywhere and sucking the talent out of all these big companies. Mm -hmm. So even some of the premierest companies in the world, like a Goldman Sachs, is, is finding it difficult to retain top technical talent. We are a pure pay technology company outside of Boston with how many schools do we have within 50 miles of us? Yeah. You know, Rich, I read an article the other day, I forget where it was, I gotta go find it, on stop trying to close the talent gap you're never going to get there. It's it's almost like remember Nick Carr does IT matter. It's sort of coming back to that. Mm -hmm. It's like look, you know, we're entering a new era now with with AI. You know, utilize that where where you possibly can. But but stop trying to be like the best IT shop in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, focus on your. I mean, it sounds so straightforward, no. but you would think that financial services is is one of the last bastions of hanging on to to IT. So you, you see this pattern. We've seen it multiple times in the industry. Another key proposition from us is we, we're a critical mass now, right? So, so we're approaching 800 people, 500 plus people in development, like 500 plus people. But we're, we're the biggest of the big now, and we're, we're now a critical mass on development. So when you look at our roadmaps, the amount that came out last year was enormous. This year is mind-blowing. So it's our next crank of that wheel. Leverage that R&D investment. That is our superpower. We're super focused in our R&D, and it's been my first two and a half years or so is just perfecting that development engine. And we're right on the precipice of really just the, the just being unstoppable, frankly, in that regard. And that's because we've hyper-invested in R&D because we start with massive anchor clients and we hyper-invest there. So we offer that, that capability to all of our future clients. Again, we run the first or second biggest insurance company in the world and the most productive independent broker dealer in the world already. You, next client, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, get the benefit of that. Who can afford that investment? Who can afford the $120 million a year investment in R&D just to, to build this infrastructure out and support it every year? Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's the no brainer. That drops right to the bottom so, line. But now you go to the top, to your point. Yeah. You got, that's, that's sold. So what's weird about us is we're a little company by comparison, but we need to sell like SAP or Oracle or Salesforce. Yeah. So we're like at the top of these companies and, it, and, and you know this play, right? It, it's digital transformation play. Mm. It, and that's an executive sell at the top of these organizations. The good news is, that's what I've been doing for the last 20 years, right? right? I mean, the prior version of digital transformation, as you'll remember this, was server consolidation. And a lot of that was driven by virtualization, virtualization yeah, right? Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> here we go again, right? It's the same story again, but that's an executive sell around business transformation. And that's really about, how are you gonna spend your dollars? So when I ran sales at Sun, am I gonna spend it in building a CRM? Or am I going to hire more salespeople? That's the, that's the business call. And that's our proposition at the top of stack. And we're really good at it. We drive advisor satisfaction, proven. We drive advisor productivity, proven. And we drive productivity in your home office. And we allow you to comp comply with the law better because we've built in compliance for your trading and your operations. 
So you can make money, you can save money in your operations, and you can stay out of jail just like we've been saying. Yeah, so you freed up capital, and they can put that in, in other aspects of their business, which is really their go-to-market. Correct. Great story. So what's the future hold? Where do you want to take this thing? Yeah, so I mean, I think uh, th this year is really about three things. Uh, delighting our existing clients, and, and we're just getting better and better at it, and that's a lot about continued execution on our roadmap, and we're super excited about that. So it's just just building a great engineering culture and just getting better and better at that and, and retooling it and continue to do that. That's the first objective. You know, roadmap execution continues to open up our TAM, et cetera. So just keep doing that, delight our clients, roadmap execution, and then go, go build the business. And so this year we're heavily investing in our go-to-market, and we've never done that before because we really need to figure out our product market fit, and now we figured that out. We figured out that the next clients aren't going to take the whole thing at once, that we need a classic software guy, land and expand strategy, enter these accounts around five specific pain, pain, pain points. By the way, it's the same play I ran at Sun when I took over sales and grew them in three quarters, right? They hadn't grown in years. Five sales plays, very targeted, known pain points, the way people buy, insert in those accounts, land and expand, do a few of those, and just get that flywheel going on the sales side. And now we're starting to think about, you know, you see that industry as being so fragmented, um, how do we think about inorganic growth? And so we did our first acquisition right at the end, tail end of last year. Oh, who'd you acquire? Uh, we acquired the technical asset, technology assets of Agreements Express. Uh -huh. And uh, they, they, had, uh, they had some uh, very interesting technology around uh, uh, custody, um, custody and clearing of assets, connectivity. Today, we, we heavily partner with uh, Fidelity. Uh, but many of our future clients clear with Pershing or Schwab uh, uh, or others. And so they had a core technology asset that would give us connectivity to these other clearing firms. And that's super important because the clearing firm basically is where the asset is held. So we don't hold securities, right? The broker dealer can't hold securities. They need to be held by a custodian, and that's a legal entity. So getting pipes to those are really important. So we're going to integrate that those technology pipes into underneath our existing platform to give us connectivity, not just to Fidelity, but to others. And so that was a technology buy aimed at increasing our TAM because the, the available market to us expands radically when we connect to Pershing. Our TAM more than doubles in that segment. So as we think about inorganic activities, there's technical plugs, and now we're starting to look at the industry again because you look at the formation of the solar system, right? Jupiter got really big. There's not there's not a lot of asteroid belt around Jupiter. Why? Because yeah, Jupiter yes. sucked it all up, right. right? So now we're thinking about, okay, well, you know, how do we, how do we grow our client base is one of our main objectives. So organically, we're working on that, looking good. Uh, how about integrate? How could we radically increase the number of clients we have? Then once, and this is what we learned at EMC, is, well, once we have a lot of clients and we have these other assets, can we cross-sell them? And we're really good at that. We know how to do that. And that's, by the way, this is one of the deficiencies of most of the acquisitions in this whole industry, is they never figured out how to do the cross-sell. And you look at every acquisition we did in EMC, and I was involved in some monster ones, Data Domain, Isilon, others, we'd, we'd buy it to be a few hundred million dollars, and all of a sudden it's two, three billion dollars. Because right. the sales force was well-organized, very disciplined, and we understood how to do a cross-sell and upsell, and we understood the technology integration points that were key to creating leverage. So acquire some of these assets, grow the number of clients, and then bring them in and understand how to do a cross-sell and expand, continue to expand our TAM, all under understanding of how to really serve enterprise clients, which is our core, our core belief. Palo Alto Networks is a good example. That's another you know, great example. They, they started in network security and then they you know, expanded, they've done acquisitions. ServiceNow is another one you know, that, that has done a great job of, 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 of cross-selling. I mean, and the integration, it's interesting, Rich, as former storage guys, right? It's right. Like, we always talk about the data, but now you're actually in the data business. Right? Correct. So, as that, opposed to the storing the data and protecting the data. Correct. And actually, there is, there's some similarity <laughs> to the data problem. When, uh, when, I, when I was at EMC, uh, and, and you know a lot of the startups I ran, um, there was an underlying data problem, which is uh, the fundamental substrate of the storage industry is a disk, which is inherently unreliable. Think about it, right? Yeah, right. They break all the time. And even flash drive breaks all the time, just for the record. And in fact, it's somewhat worse, but we can talk about that a different day. So the underlying substrate of that entire industry is the fact that the data is bad. And that whole industry is built on one idea, one idea, which is the underlying substrate breaks all the time, but we still need to give you back your data. 
That's really, all the layers of software that are in storage are about that one idea. We have the same problem in this industry. The data is wrong all the time, but we got to make it usable for mortals. It's just a higher level of the problem, and it's actually more complicated because there's so many disparate data sources and there are absolutely no standards, none, zero. Most companies are still using flat files they send you. It's really cuckoo, it's so antiquated. So it's a nasty problem. And what, I, what got me excited about coming here is like it's such a nasty problem and we're good at it. Yeah. So that you couple that with understanding the workflow, which my, the founder, Darren, my, Darren Tedesco, my partner in crime here, he's a deep financial services guy, right? Knows the home office of the broker deal, but more importantly, knows the life of the advisor. Right. So you, you solve this nasty data problem, understand the workflow, and then delight them with an amazing user experience that's the magic, right? Solve it cross asset, right? Insurance, investments, and banking together. Solve the data problem. Create these portals. Understand the workflow and the persona in each one of those. Create a great experience. Get them to focus on what they do well, which is going selling their financial products by leveraging our technology. Why would they invest in that? Just give that to us. We're great at it. Yeah, it's a great story, Rich. Of like I say, at the start, a tech executive who's now sort of gone into a new industry, but bringing a lot of the disciplines, I often say, every industry is a technology business, every industry is a SaaS business, the question is how you get there, as you say, it's part of the digital transformation. Well, congratulations on getting here. It sounds like it's been, been quite a journey, a challenging one, but actually pretty quick. I mean, you know, kind of through COVID, right. and now, you know, the post-isolation economy, it sounds like you're really ready to scale. No, no. Appreciate no. you coming in. No, it's so great. Dave, great to be here. Great to see you again. It's been a few years, but uh, yeah. and, uh, and uh, a different uh, vertical. But this is a great forum. I uh, pitch from my, my my friend Dave and, uh, and the team. What they do here is remarkable. You know these interviews. I, I watch them. I still learn from them. I think uh, what you do is a service to all of us in this industry, uh, which is why when you said come in, I said of course. Right? Uh, thank you. I you appreciate know. it. It's, it's, it's such a great story, and we love to share. We you know we're all about free content and. Uh, yeah, we're doing some exciting things with, uh, with foundation models and generative AI, taking the whole corpus of cube data and making it available for our, our audience. And, uh, you know, we're experimenting with that now and it's, uh, it's a pretty exciting time. I wish I were 25 again. Uh, <laughs> but, it, but it's fun to watch you because you're innovating yourself. Every time I talk to you, you know, you're always innovating, right? And the whole format of the cube is, it was remarkable from the beginning. And, and, and you know, some of your, your greatest partners, you know, whether it be Amazon or others, right? Think about mm. your, I've watched your journey too, right? Which is, you know, you're all IT infrastructure and then all of a sudden like you're the number one thing at Amazon, yeah. right? Like <laughs> it's incredible. So you watched, you stayed ahead of that curve and continued to innovate and leverage technology. And so, uh, but that's the service that I think you provide to the industry. Yeah, thank you. So John Furrier has been a huge part of that, right? He's always- For a long, forget it. I mean, amazing. He's unbelievable. Right, he's unbelievable, yeah. He's always thinking four steps ahead. Yeah, so. yeah. I know you guys do a great job, so thank you. Yeah, great to see you, Rich. Awesome. Thank you. All right, keep it right there. For more content on theCUBE, go to thecube.net and uh, reach out at Dave Vellante. Thanks for watching.